started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans, and nose to the ground. I wasn't having fun. It wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me. I've been in this mental health game my whole life. And mental health as a mom, oh my gosh, huge. I think that healing myself and motherhood has has to go hand in hand because he is happier and better for it because I've done the work on myself. And it needs to start with you believing in yourself that no matter what is going on around you, that you as a person right now, you are worthy. You are purposeful. You are needed. I feel like I'm finally home. <laughs> I feel like I'm finally in this place where I am happy to be me. I'm happy in my skin and I am so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves because it took me a long time to get here. I'm always into growth. I've always been into transformation. I have been into self-development ever since I could remember reading all the books and watching all the movies. And so I've always been growing and changing. And my husband, I remember him saying like, it seems like every time I come home, you're a new woman, <laughs> you're a whole new person. And for him, it wasn't always like, you're a new person. Yay. <laughs> it was like, you're, who are you? Like, what is happening? I know even before, like we got married, I came back from five months of being away and we got married, what, three months later, that was like the biggest change. And so for him, it was like, who am I even marrying? Like, who are you now? For me, it was also a little scary to get married because I'm like, I have gone through this like life-changing moment and what are we going to do with that? And so, yeah, it's, it's been a ride. It's been a fun roller coaster. <laughs> That's the word that comes to my mind. It's been like a journey. Before I speak on compromises, I, I learned, I don't know when I learned this, but it was like one of those things that kind of blows your mind is in a relationship, it shouldn't be about compromise. It should be about a win-win. It should be about how can we do this to everybody win. So when we moved to Texas, I think that's what fostered us to be able to move to Texas in a way that was a win-win because he was working in Midland in the middle of nowhere, which it's middle of nowhere. There was nothing out there. And to be close to him, that's where I had to be. But I chose to be in Austin because it was where I could grow my cosmetology business. It was where it was a city. It was like there was thriving and it was fun. And because we looked at it from the point of we both want to be happy. We just want to be close to each other. We were able to foster kind of a win-win, no compromise. I don't know when I learned that, but that has been an amazing philosophy for our relationship because even when it's hard, we always look for the win-win. Like how can we both benefit from this? How can it not just be one person completely giving up what they want and how they are want to feel for the other person. And I think that has been like the game changer for our relationship. Before we found out I was expecting, I was told that I wasn't going to be able to have kids. So I was told that from an early age, I believe it was my freshman year in high school, I was told that due to having endometriosis, I was not going to be able to have kids. And I also probably TMI, but tilted uterus also going to make it hard. So it was like a double whammy. So for the longest time, that's all I ever heard in my ears. You're not going to be able to have kids. You're not going to be able to have kids. So I felt like we were never not trying to have kids. <laughs> like we were never not trying to have kids. And when we were really, really trying for the, for after we got married for the f two years after we got married, we were really trying and it wasn't working. And I remember telling my mother, like, I don't think I'm pregnant again this month. Like I've been cramping and I'm not pregnant. And she's just kept saying, you got to believe like when it's meant to happen, it will happen. And my husband that night was like, your period is late. Your period is never late. He like knows it better than I do. And so he went to the store and got a pregnancy test and the pregnancy test actually was faulty. It was like a broken pregnancy test. Nothing happened forever and ever and ever like hours. And so I threw away the pregnancy test and was like, I'm not pregnant. 
I woke up to go use the bathroom and the pregnancy test was on top of the trash can. And sure enough, there's those two lines. And I'm like, what the heck? This is the middle of the night now. And I'm like, no way, this has to be broken. So I just go to bed. I don't wake up my husband. I wake up in the morning, take another test. And that one was quick. And I run out of the bathroom and I'm just like speechless. I wake up my husband and he's like, dead out of sleep i'm freaking out and he the first thing he does is like smacks his forehead like oh my gosh like it's really happening we're in a pandemic we both lost our jobs <laughs> i can laugh about it now but he was probably like really like like we're living in williston north dakota like we're not near family like there was just so much i'm sure that went through his head at that time for him to be less like wow and I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's finally happening. Like, wow. So I go outside to let my dog out and I'm on the phone with my mom. And I'm, of course, the first thing in my mind is, holy crap, mom. Like, I've already been taking ibuprofen. Like, holy crap, mom, what have I done already? Like, just like on, up to this point. And she told, tells me, take a deep breath. And so I do. And she's all, this is a blessing. I start bawling my eyes out. And I'm like, oh my God, this is what I've always wanted. <laughs> And it truly was, it truly is. It's the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> that was my thought process is what have I done in the last four weeks? Could it hurt this baby? Like, oh my gosh, I did not know. I thought I was cramping. So I was taking ibuprofen. I'm like, mom, is that going to hurt the baby? And she just like, no, just be, feel this moment, like be in this moment and realize what a blessing it is that you're pregnant. Like you've been trying for two years and you're pregnant. <laughs> Nine months of pregnancy was rough. <sighs> Nine months of pregnancy was not easy for me. Nine months of pregnancy was not easy for my husband. So once I found out I was pregnant, I started, I'm a researcher. I will research until forever. I love learning. I love reading. And so I decided to do hypnobirthing, which requires a lot of meditation. I did it in the morning and at night, and I was just always hypnobirthing, connecting to my baby, connecting to my body and working on my mindset that my body was made to do this. Like, this is all natural. This is all normal. So that's where the headspace I was in was like, I'm going to be as calm as I can be for this baby. I'm going to just do the best I can in that process. Like I said, it was the pandemic. So both my husband and I weren't working. We were living in Williston, North Dakota. My husband's best friend lives in Bozeman, Montana. So we, he told, tells him like, you can come work for my company. He builds homes. And my husband's like, well, yeah, I'm having a baby. So we're doing it. So we look for what feels like ever for a place to live in Bozeman. There was nowhere to live. Everything that we found had like 50 applications deep, like there was nowhere to live. So we actually moved to Bozeman with all our stuff in a U-Haul living at the Holiday Inn while we looked for a place to live because we couldn't find a place. And then the only place that we could find to live was like $2,200 a month. It was the only place we could find. And so that added on to the pressure and the stress of everything. Yeah, my husband did not handle that transition well. And that was the height of his drinking. That was how he dealt with it was drinking and working and drinking and working. And at some point I couldn't handle, I couldn't handle the vibe. I couldn't handle his woe is me. I couldn't handle, I couldn't handle it. So I left actually for three months and came home to live with my parents. I had lived with my parents for years and years and years and years. So me doing what I did, like going home to live with my parents, that was a big thing for me to do. I felt like it was my only option at that point. I'm super proud of myself for making that decision. I'm super proud of myself for knowing that this baby in my belly is the most important. And if I don't feel good, this baby's not going to feel good. But I did have all the, the morning sickness, I felt like I had the, I was the person who had it the whole time. <laughs> like they call it morning sickness, but it should be all day sickness. Had low iron, low levels of iron. So they had to put me on iron. They were doing blood work to watch it. Like there was a few different things that happened that were scare through the pregnancy. 
But through it all, I just, I just kept knowing that I wanted to have a natural birth. So that was my main focus was focusing on how am I going to have this natural birth? I didn't get that. I didn't get the natural birth. I tried for 30 plus hours to have this natural birth, but it didn't work out for me. He had to come out with an emergency C-section because his heart rate dropped when they were trying to get him out with the forceps. So not only was my pregnancy hard, my delivery was hard, but what I've talked with one of my really, really good friends who has a daughter, she said, it's almost like, cause she kind of had the experience of having the baby come out through C-section as well. And she said, it's almost like a rebirth. It's almost like losing that old part of yourself and becoming a mother. And that reframe for me was everything that reframe of like, yes, it was hard. Yes, it was traumatizing almost, but look what that has brought you. Look what you've got to look forward to now. Three months away, I honestly, that whole time I was just, I don't know if I believed that we would make it honestly through that whole time. I was like, I'm becoming a mom now. Like my responsibility is to this child. And that is my responsibility is this child. And I kept communicating to my husband during this time that you're about to be a dad. It's time for you to step up. But I had my friends and my coach and my, I was also doing counseling during this time. And they were in my ear telling me like, sometimes for the guys, they don't realize that it's actually happening because it's not in their body. Like they don't feel the change. Like it takes a while for them to be like, oh my gosh, I'm a dad. And so I started thinking of it through that lens. Like to him, it's just like almost like telling a stranger I'm pregnant. Because they're, they're not living it. They're not experiencing what the woman who's growing this child in their body is experiencing. And so there was a, after that three month, there was that point where it was like, go back and try to connect with my husband. Because at the end of the day, he's the person that I want to do life with. At the end of the day, that promise we made with each other was there. And so I went back and I mean, like, I would love to say I went back and everything was rosy. Yeah, it was hard at first to figure it out together, but we both started going to counseling together and getting that help that we needed together. And it started to become very real because my belly was out to here. So it started becoming more real. And I think that's what really did the big shift was like, this is really happening. This isn't just talk anymore. I am so proud of my husband. He is over eight months sober now. Like, wow. Like he went from drinking every day, multiple times a day, stressed out to blooming is the only way I know how to say it into this like father and this husband that I'm so thankful I didn't give up. I am so thankful that we decided to work through it. I'm so thankful that we made that decision that together we could do anything. And that's, we're living proof that if you put in the work in your marriage, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but if you put in the work, both of you, it's not just one-sided that you can actually make it, make a difference. How does being a parent change you? Being a parent changes, changed me. I mean, being a parent has been so life-giving for me. I didn't think I had it in me for like the longest time. And I think that was a part of the reason why it took so long for me to get pregnant is because even though I wanted it so badly, I think subconsciously, I was just like, it was so hard for my parents. And it was so hard for a lot of people that I hear how hard parenthood is and motherhood is that I was fearful of it. Honestly, becoming a parent has been so life-giving. I have so much love for my son that I've been able to open up to that love that I have for my creator, which to me is God. That's my creator. There's this love out there for me. That's this much. My mom's like, it's more. And I was like, there's love out there for me. That's more than this. Like I am so in love with my son. I would do anything for him. And that I know how most mothers feel. And I've been able to open up to this love and been able to receive this love from the universe that courses through me. Oh my gosh, it floods me in a way that I've never had before. And it was from having my son and knowing that I love him this much that I've been allowing myself to open up and receive the love from, if you call it the universe, if you call it divine guidance, you call it spirit. But I 
ever since this opening, it's just like been a rebirth for me. I'm like a whole different person. I have so much love to give and I see people in a whole different way now as well, being a mom. Like we're all love, we're all connected. We're all honestly on this planet, like I've heard in such a beautiful way is like walking each other home. Like we're here to like make each other's lives better. And having him like has brought fun into my life, has brought play into my life, has allowed me to open to receive this love that has always been there for me, but I wasn't open to it. I wasn't able to receive it. And so being a mom, hands down the best thing I've ever done. If you're not changing, you're dying. I don't know when I heard that, but I heard that from early on that we were put on this earth to grow and evolve. My husband, like I said earlier, did not see it that way. He thought, I've created this person and this is who I'm going to be. And so for me to always be changing and growing, it was almost like, wait, what? Why? <laughs> Why are you changing? Why are you growing? But each time I pushed myself out of my comfort zone, each time I expanded, it just felt better. Like I felt more open. I felt more myself. And I kept like, was I'm hungry for that. I'm hungry for that feeling of that oneness, for that feeling of like total connection and alignment to my greater power, my greater good. Like I've always been open to that because I've seen my mother has been through some things and she has been able to sit in it and like be okay in it. And so seeing her is that is my example of like, you could go through hard things and still smile. You can go through hard things and still be happy. You go through hard things and still put love out into the world. And so that has been my example. And that is what I've tried to emulate. And that's what I've been searching for. And actually yesterday we went to evening church for Thanksgiving and she just hugged me so hard and said, I just am so thankful that you're here now. Like I see you. And <laughs> Reliving that moment makes my heart so happy, but I feel like I'm finally home. <laughs> I feel like I'm finally in this place where I am happy to be me. I'm happy in my skin. I'm thankful for who I am. I'm thankful for the journey that I've lived. And I am just so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves. Cause it took me a long time to get here. I'm helping people connect to their body. I'm helping people come up with the commitment that they want to live. They want to see brought to light. I'm helping women practice presence in their body. I'm helping them feel safe knowing that the younger versions of themselves that they're ashamed of, that they felt guilty for. Wow, how amazing it is that they survived. Like they did so much for us. And they, that younger person did everything they could to get us to this point. And I think a lot of times, I you know before my transformation, I was so ashamed of that girl. I was so beat her up. I was like, why didn't you do better? Or why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Like just beating her up. And honestly, every younger version of me just brought me to this point and did the best they could. And for my inner little Josie, I just want to hug her so tight and be like, oh my gosh, you're a rock star. You're amazing. You are brilliant. Thank you for getting me here. And that's what my dream, my hope is for the women that I work with is for them to be able to look back without that shame, without that guilt and be able to open to receive this love that is waiting for you. That's always here, no matter what, it's always here. And to be able to take those experiences that have been traumatizing and use them for good. Because I believe that when we tell our story, when we tell our truth, it opens other people up to tell their story, tell their truth. Like our mess, our problems, our traumas can foster openings for other people. And that is my wish. And that's my mission. And 
I've never felt so more purposeful in my life. I've been a, I was a cosmetologist for 10 years behind the chair and women would just open up and pour their hearts out to me. And I would help them transform their outer appearance. And they would look in the mirror and I could see them light up and feel so good and so beautiful about themselves. And I, that was my favorite part of what I did was that turning them to the mirror and be like, there you are. Like, do you see you? And they did. But what I know is that that didn't last. Like when they went home, that feeling, that lit upness that I saw in the mirror did not last. And so this just was such a great transition for me to be like, I don't just want to help women look good on the outside. I want that light to shine from the inside out. I want them to feel that power that they are because, oh my gosh, women, we are so powerful. We are so powerful. We create life. We Oh my gosh, we were created to be queens. We were created to be everything, but it doesn't, you don't feel that until you start to believe it. And you don't believe it until you start to trust yourself and you don't trust yourself until you start to feel safe. So that is what I'm here doing. That's my mission. So coming back to the body. So through somatics, somatics is working with the soma. Our bodies hold on to everything. Like we think we're burying it deep. We think it doesn't exist anymore. We think that if we just, like I was doing, which is faking it till you make it, that we will eventually come to this place of total transformation. But what I've learned is that it doesn't work that way. We have to work with the body. We have to find out where that is stored and bring it to light. We have to bring it out into the open in order to like dissect it and look at it and be able to move through it. And so somatics is huge part of what I do and just dropping into your body at first it's a little hard to drop into that body because I mean for the longest time some of us didn't feel safe in our body but for me it was that dropping into my body and being like oh my gosh I'm safe here now like it's different here now like I can look to the past but I also can come to the present and be like okay it's safe for me to be here now. And then through that, I've been able to develop a commitment to myself. And for me, the commitment I've been working on for the last year has been on self-love, on loving myself to life. And from that love, I'm able to pour from the overflow. And wow, do I have so much love to give because I have put myself in that place where it's like, I can love myself into life. How many other people can I love into life? <laughs> and so yeah, through somatic practices and different tools. And it does require you to do the practices. It does require you to show up for yourself. But once you do, it's so rewarding. Yeah, the soma is the body. And I discovered this during the the, height, the beginning of the pandemic. I took a coaching course through Strozzi Institute. And it was all about working with the body. So I thought I was taking this coaching course to help people. <laughs> what I've learned is I helped myself. Like I healed myself. Like that work was for me. There's no way I would be able to help others if I didn't go into it that way to heal myself and my soma and declare those commitments to myself and find in my body is where it lives. So somatic practices has you centering yourself and you're not just centering yourself like a regular meditation. You're going through your dignity. You're going through setting boundaries. You're going through being able to receive. You're acknowledging your past, your ancestry. You're acknowledging your cultural differences. You're acknowledging being a woman in this world. And you're also looking to the present and you're looking to the future. So it's just like a whole embodiment of what it is you want to be, because I do believe that it starts with what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? That is what leads to the doing. That is what leads to the having. And so sabbatic has you really practicing and honing in into what it is that you want to be who it is that you want to be. And I think that is why it's so powerful. And that is why it really works. The reason why I teach it is because it was hard for me for the longest time. Growing up, being the only Black girl, being the only African-American girl in my schools, in my little town that I lived in for until what? I think 11th grade, we had another family that came in. 
I didn't love myself. I didn't like who I saw in the mirror when I looked in the mirror. I thought my nose was too big. I wished my skin was lighter. My hair was too curly. I wished it was straight. The moment I got makeup, it was like put on that face, cover it up. My makeup was like two or three shades lighter. And I thought that's what was beautiful. I mean, oh my gosh, there was no self-love there at all at the beginning. I did not like what I saw. I wanted to be like everybody else. And growing up, my mom would always put micro braids, which is individual braids in our hair. And one day she's putting the braids in my hair. And I said, mom, I, everybody has bangs at school. I want bangs. And she's like, no, you do not want bangs because if you have bangs, you have to flat iron them. You have to curl them every day, which means you have to put heat and heat on curly hair. Curly hair is already brittle. It has no moisture. Like you have to add the moisture in curly hair. And she was warning me and telling me like, you don't want this. And I'm like, nope, I want to look like everybody else. I want bangs at least. Like I have to have braids, at least give me bangs. And so she's like, okay. So she left those that hair out. And of course I was curling it every day. And lo and behold, after two or three days, it fried off onto the curling iron gone. I had a little nub left, like gone. I can laugh about it now, but that was traumatic for me. And then being put in foster care and trying to find somebody to do my hair, there was nobody to do my hair. And so then I was left with this mess of curly hair that I did not like at the time. I did not know how to deal with at the time. I was ashamed of at the time. So I was just, it was just so much self-loathing. It was just so much, I was not happy in my skin. Cosmetology for me was crazy how going into cosmetology happened. Honestly, I remember growing up once my mom did start doing my hair again. And she says, what are you going to do without me one day when I can't do your hair? (laughs) You have to learn how to do your hair. That was always in my mind somewhere. And at the time I was working at a bank, I was working at Key Bank as a teller. And I had this woman always coming into the bank saying like, your makeup is always on point. Your hair always looks good. Like, have you ever thought of being a cosmetologist? Like, and I was like, no, because in my mind, it was always like cosmetology is something you do to help you get to where you want to go. Like, it's just a trade. That's I don't know who put that in my mind, but that was what was in my mind. And so it was like working at the bank was my professional job. It was what I was going to do. I was going to work up that ladder of work at the bank. Eventually I wanted to run the bank. Like I, that was the dream, right? Then 2008 happened and the market crashed. And that was the best thing that could have happened to me. I lost my job. And then I started looking at a new what am I going to do now? And I looked into going to cosmetology school and I got a scholarship to go to cosmetology school and I fell in love with it. I was able to create. And since the beginning of cosmetology school, they've always called me the, I don't even know the word that he used to describe me, but they always said, I, I see a picture and I could just create it. They wanted me to do it in a way that was like robotic. They wanted me to do it in a way that everybody was, was doing it, but I was able to do hair in a whole different way. I was, I was able just to see the picture and create it. And I remember I was in one of the advanced education classes and they were just like, if somebody is sitting out in the chair watching you work, they want to see you do exactly what you do what everybody else is doing. They want to see you doing that. They want to see you parting the hair just perfectly. They want to see you blow drying it in sections just perfectly. And so for that moment on, I started being robotic and that took the fun and the joy of doing hair gone. And so for the first couple of years of doing hair, I was that robot. But once I figured out, I get to put my flavor on it. I get to be creative. I could do hair the way that I do hair. I That's why people come and sit in my chair. That's what it became fun again. And that's when I was like, wow, I look at pictures from when I was the robot to when I was me. My work is just so much more, like so much more beautiful, like just letting it flow through me and being a cosmetologist. And it's so great because I get to do my mom's hair now. Like the woman who did my hair between her legs for many years, I would sit in between my mom's legs every Sunday. She would do my hair for the week. Now I get to do her hair and... It's such a beautiful thing. Thanks for listening to the Make Life Fun Show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Leave us a review. We are also on YouTube as well. And wherever you like to listen to your podcast, let us know what you love, 
about this show because the more you love it, the more other people can enjoy it too. And that ripple effect, right? So I am so glad you are here. Stay blessed by the best. Until next time, we will talk soon.